boys and ghouls! It's that scariest time of the year! Yes! October 29th! Boogity boogity boo! Why can't Halloween just be on a Saturday for once? Halloween is almost here, and if I want to get my student debt forgiven, I have to make a scary video about spooky things. So why not go over the most impactful genre of the last 10 years? Horror! Yeah, some of you may be thinking that the most influential games of the past decade would be games like Minecraft or Dark Souls, Breath of the Wild, or Shovel Knight. I say fooey to the lot of them! Horror has impacted society in a way we can actually feel. Uh, that is, by making YouTube a fair bit more difficult to sift through without seeing how far somebody's mouth can stretch. Viral horror is a subset of horror games that have managed to absolutely blow up and become synonymous with YouTube recommendations, Twitter posts, and eventually haunting articles written about how the creators coded the game with baby bones. Horror is pretty much the perfect genre for YouTube and social media in the same way that comedy is. Horror and comedy are both set up to elicit a very specific reaction, whether that be funny fat man fall down or I could drown a dog with all the piss I just made. It's quick and most importantly clippable. You can take a funny joke or a scary moment and pass it around, and regardless of the context, it'll get a reaction if it's well made. What makes comedy and horror even more similar is what I just said, context. Sure, that moment was funny or scary out of context, but imagine how good it would be in context. For horror, seeing a big scary palooka give you the shakedown is all well and good, but having to stew in the fear leading up to that scare, it can make it 10 times more effective. So I've managed to describe horror, yes, I do believe I deserve a medal for this. What makes it viral horror? Oh, this guy mostly. The internet is trying very hard to get him to show everybody his balls right now. YouTube as a platform does wonders for the horror genre, as it gives people the one thing that some people need to make it through a scary experience. A friend. Viral horror games have kickstarted entire careers on platforms like YouTube and Blip TV. It's coming back. And it's down to a number of things. The games themselves are always nerve wracking, not just for you, but for the person playing. It shows off a lot of personality and how they react to different situations they're faced with. Whether they're succeeding, failing, frustrated, scared, and it makes it feel like you're on that terrifying journey with a familiar face. Am I describing a parasocial relationship? Maybe, but now oh, I know you. You're too smart to fall for anything like that. Oh, I enjoy so many of your individual characteristics. Whether you like these games or not, they have not only changed the face of horror, but of gaming and content creation as a whole. Today, in the spirit of the season, and also wanting to maybe uh, rake in a few bucks from any children's eyes wandering onto the thumbnail of this video, we're going to be talking about as many viral horror games as I feel like talking about before I get tired and take a nap. So where do you start when trying to figure out the start of the viral horror trend? I don't know, I know I'll be wrong no matter what I say, so let's start somewhere around 2010. There are gonna be a lot of people asking for me to throw it back about two years to cover Aoni, or five years to cover Yume Nikki, and even all the way back to 1996 to talk about Corpse Party, but there's a lot of reasons I don't want to start there. For Corpse Party, that's a series that's been around longer than I have, with more stuff than I know what to do with. If I start talking about the theme park attractions, I don't know if I can stop the video from being all Corpse Party. Also, I don't know anything about Corpse Party. Aoni is a lot the same. You probably know it as the game with the mean-faced man, but did you know that Mean Face launched a manga, anime, and live-action film adaptation? As for Yume Nikki, if I'm being honest, I don't really consider that much of a horror game and more a game with horror elements. Wow, Jack, how are you still alive being that pedantic? Listen, if enough people want me to talk about RPG Maker horror games some other time, I'll do it, but for what I want to cover, I think 2010 is the best place to start. That's the year that Amnesia The Dark Descent was released. Sweden was getting back at the rest of the world by releasing this game in 2010 with Frictional Games at the helm of the attack. They were previously unknown for their work on the Penumbra series and were well experienced with what made scary games scary. 2010 was a very fun time to be a horror fan, and that the landscape of the medium was absolutely terrifying. Long-standing horror series were falling apart at the seams as Resident Evil became Banana Hammock Man fighting the Matrix fart, and Silent Hill was owned by Konami. The horror! Sure, games like Dead Space were kind of giving people what they wanted, but when you have a gun that rips off people's limbs and you can make the scary people stop hurting you for a minute while you stomp on their heads, there's an element missing. Amnesia found that element and wore it like a badge of honor. Helplessness. Amnesia The Dark Descent is all about you, a guy named Daniel stuck in a castle. Dude, anybody named Daniel who's watching this while currently stuck in a castle is gonna feel so freaked out. You find notes from yourself letting you know that you put yourself in here and that you have to kill the castle's baron to make shadows stop chasing you. 
From there, it's only you, the occasional lantern, and the sturdiest cupboards known to man between your guts and the floor. The way that amnesia amplifies this feeling of helplessness I mentioned is through a number of ways. Like I said, you don't have any weapons, you can't kill enemies, the best you can hope for is to go unnoticed, or at the very least, live. This is even harder when the game makes everything an enemy. In addition to your health, you have sanity, which rapidly decreases when you're in the dark, or when witnessing horrible things like... Well, this guy. This game found the perfect way to get the most out of a limited environment, and turn something that in most games is an annoyance and make it into a defining characteristic. Everybody is scared of the dark, but that's usually because there's gonna be a scary animal or hepatitis in it. But when a jawless horror is there instead, it gets even worse. Amnesia scratched the perfect itch and did it at the exact right time. Around this time was when more personality-based playthroughs of games were getting more popular, seeing someone play a game not just to see the game, but to see that person play it. Amnesia was the perfect game for this, since it was atmospheric enough to drag you in even just by watching somebody else play it. Being able to watch someone else go through the game without risking the scares yourself is pretty much the bedrock of the entire viral horror market, and Amnesia can definitely hang its hat on laying that bedrock. Did you know there's a sequel to Amnesia? Yeah, like, one of the most influential games of all time in terms of horror and junk, and it got a sequel, but not one person has ever mentioned it outside the year it was released in, and that's really strange to me. I might come back and talk about this again someday, but just like, no one cares about a machine for pigs, and that's really weird. So YouTubers had a scary game they could play, and for as much as Amnesia set them in motion on the right track, it wasn't the game that greased the wheels. That would be Slender the Eight Pages. So, you're probably asking, tall, slender, white guy, I see Larry Bird on TV all the time, I'm used to this, what's scary? Well, for that, we have to go all the way back to the halcyon days of 2009. WrestleMania 25 was stinking up the place, and the website Something Awful was holding its weekly Photoshop contest. This week's prompt? A Bigfoot-style cryptid photo. Well, I bet this isn't gonna change the course of internet history or anything. Lots of tentative term here, art, was submitted to this thread, but everything came to a screeching halt when this bad mamma jamma hit the scene. Victor Surge, real fake name Eric Knudsen, created these unsettling images of a tall, slender figure in the background of pictures, standing near children in parks, or seemingly completely missable, with captions saying that these photos were all that remained after a library fire. People could not get enough of the newly dubbed slender Man. The entire Something Awful forums for Photoshop Fridays devolved into wanting to know more and more about Slender Man, getting to know whatever they could from cobbling together whatever lore they could get from Eric's posts. Keep in mind, this was getting a genuine reaction from people on the internet, and that is a Herculean task, so doing it on Something Awful of all places was a testament to the power of Slender Man. He's an incredibly striking visual, someone who blends into the background so well that you won't even notice he's there until you really stare at the picture. It was on these Something Awful forums that something awful was brewing. New lore, that is. People were so excited to get in on the craze that soon floods of information from anybody with two working index fingers came rolling in, muddying the waters on what exactly a Slender Man was or what he could do. There were some people who were saying that that wasn't a suit he was wearing and that's just what his skin looked like. These people didn't get it. Someone who did get it was the user C.E. Gars, who started pointing people towards a Slender Man series, Marble Hornets. This would go on to not only be the most popular, but also the most formative entry in the Slender Man mythos. It follows the user after his friend Alex goes cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs when he's stalked by Slender Man, renamed The Operator, because Slender Man is a fine name when you're just writing about him, but the second someone says the name out loud, you realize. Oh, this is stupid. The series spanned for years and years with side channels made to enhance it, fan art and theories flooding the web, and a true breakthrough of Slender Man from something awful boogeyman to full-on internet urban legend, magnified a hundred times over thanks to the eight pages. Now, was this the first Slender Man video game? It only just makes it onto the podium. If you're looking for the first Slender Man game, you're looking for Slender Invasion. If I had to hazard a guess, someone was just making a zombie game and decided to dress them a little nicer and give them white face to get more eyes on the game. It was released the same year as the original Slender Boom started on Something Awful, so the turnaround, if nothing else, is impressive. After that, we have Slender Man The Game, made for a game jam by a handful of indie devs. Even if neither of these games is exactly impressive, they still come out first, so when you say The Eight Pages is the first, you're kind of disrespecting a lot of hard work. And it's not like The Eight Pages itself has a lot more effort put in. So in this game, you play as a guy doing a thing. You're wandering around this 
forest looking for eight pages and the slenderific man is trying to put a stop to you. Is this game mechanically complex? No. Is it scary? No. Is it good? No. Slender is about as standard a game as you could get. You could boot up just about any game engine, type in one game please, and this would be what comes up. Slender is painfully simple. Collect the pages, avoid Slenderman. These get harder the longer it goes on. It's just, that's it? Like the game is only a few minutes long if you know what you're doing, and until you do figure it out, you're just running your head into a wall over and over again trying to find its weak spot. The game can imitate excitement for moments at a time when Slenderman futzes with the antenna and ruins the reception, but other than that, you're just walking through the woods. Very, very boring woods. And you may think that that's building tension, but when this is what you're building up to, it's hard to exactly stay scared. Slenderman is not scary. He can be. He can be very scary, but not here, because he can't do anything. The worst he can do is teleport in front of you and kill you instantly with no warning, but if that description doesn't exactly sound fun, it's because it's as entertaining as a wet sock. The only part where the game actually accomplishes what it's going for is when you enter this small building. Uh, the sense of claustrophobia is way more affected than the intended terror of seeing Slenderman out in the woods. I know the idea is that you don't even realize you see him until it's too late, but that more often than not leads to you feeling like he comes out of nowhere in an unfair, annoying way. Also, it's not exactly a good sign if you can miss the monster. In here, the terror comes from how if he is there, you have no way of running away. This is the feeling of helplessness amnesia did so well, and it's the thing that absolutely sinks this idea. Just turn around. Slenderman is rendered completely helpless if you just stop looking at him and walk in the other direction. The same way schools tried to get us to handle bullies was actually just Slenderman training. So the game's boring, not scary, and has one good section in it. That didn't stop it from becoming one of the biggest hits of 2000. 2011. This game caught fire. Everybody who was anybody was playing it or trying to act tough by saying it wasn't scary. Uh, not me though. I, 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 my, my mom said I people were watching and the content was getting absorbed by people who had not only never seen Marble Hornets, uh, they had never even seen the original Something Awful forum posts explaining what this guy's deal was. Then the worst type of people, children, got their hands on it. Slenderman was slowly being taken away from 30 somethings on internet forums who DESERVED Slender Man, and he was slowly being given to children who drew him open mouth kissing Jeff the Killer, doing Gangnam Style, his image was getting the mainstream sanding of all of his rough edges. Uh, but why do people still find Jason Voorhees and Freddy Krueger scary? He had a power glove once! Why was Slender Man fading so fast? Well, that could be down to flat out oversaturation. 2011 was also the rise of the App Store on mobile phones. Stores that needed apps to plop onto people's phones, and as such, they had much loose requirements than most online retailers. I said that part with a straight face. You could probably put this video on Steam for a few bones. Hundreds of low-quality Slenderman games were plastered all over the app store. Slenderman in a hospital, Slenderman in school, Slenderman in the sewers. If there was a location, Slenderman was all over it like slime. They were all just the same game as the eight pages, and the same game included the exact same jump scare over and over and over. And as we'll discuss later with a slightly bigger franchise, that can lose its luster fast. So Slenderman was now lol, epic, and random in that order, and a far cry from the horror icon he was at the start. Perhaps Blue Isle Games could turn that around. In collaboration with Parsect Games, the makers of the eight pages, Slender the Arrival would be the next step forward for the Slender story, helped massively by having the original creator, Eric, on board. This game has been burning a hole in my Steam library for years. I bought it in the same mindset you buy a juicer. I'm gonna get so much use out of this thing, and then you use it as a nightstand. It's definitely a massive graphical improvement, and comes packaged with a story at no extra cost, but not only is the gameplay the same as the original eight pages, it's so much longer than a game like this has any right to be. Every level is the exact same scavenger hunt just for different things in different areas with a slightly different annoying guy trying to get ya. In the second stretch of the game, you have to deal with the human flea and their inability to do anything right. You shove your flashlight up her eye socket and she runs off, but this is just you flipping the generators and you get to go and find a tape of your definitely not a flea man friend Kate as she gets attacked by Slenderman. 
on. Here, you get to close windows. Then Slenderman sets the world on fire. He allegedly shows up in this section, but I mistook him for a tree. Then you get attacked, and then the game's over. It's all jump scares with no real buildup. I'm not afraid of Slenderman. I'm inconvenienced by him. Slender the Arrival did not have near the same staying power as the original. By comparison, it fell off and died like a mayfly. Seeing as the game was worth porting to mobile last year, I say it was a pretty big success for Blue Isle, but still, I think this style of game is just massively flawed. Jump scares aren't really scary, at best they're just surprising, and something that's really scary I feel like should stick with you long after the scare is over. A jump scare's effectiveness lives and dies in microseconds, so relying on it solely for a game's horror value is a big mistake. So what's Slenderman up to these days? Well, 2014, nobody wants to talk about Slenderman ever again. I'm not going into detail about the stabbing, it's an awful, dreadful situation that thankfully didn't result in anybody losing their lives, but it put the kibosh on any major Slenderman media. Major, of course, except for the movies. Companies had movies lined up to cash in on Slenderman, but the whole idea went to bust in the middle of post-production. Many elected to just throw them out into the world and plug their ears like they lit dynamite. Several of them are very bad, but the best came when Sony Pictures threw its hat into the ring with Slenderman, realizing the problem with the horror games was the omission of the word man. This is a movie in the same way that I'm a duck. They share similarities, but they're not the same thing. This is a movie where they find out their friend was a part of an internet forum about taking people into the woods and killing them for Slender Man. I like to give them the benefit of the doubt, but... Fuck, that's rough. The only good thing about this movie is Slender Man himself. He at least looks good because they found Slender Man's son, Keith, to play him. Listen, I know this movie's supposed to be scary, but I was watching the behind the scenes features and they just got him strung up like SpongeBob from the end of the movie. I might have been a bit too harsh. Slender Man nowadays is. Nobody cares, all right? It's nothing now. He used to run the roost, but now he's practically vapor. Do I think he can make a comeback? No. No, he shouldn't. So time was passing, as it often does, and there needed to be a new king of the horror games. Containment Breach was kind of that. It certainly made a lot more people way more aware of the larger SCP Foundation mythos than they would have been otherwise, but it was never really the number one game in town. It was a good utility player. That may be because of its 2012 release date, wedged in between Slender and the biggest horror franchise of the 21st century. Five Nights at Freddy's! Oh, I'm not excited to talk about this one. Not because they're bad, some of them are bad, but because there's a lot to go over. The creation of Scott Cawthon, FNAF came about how most great inventions do, when its creator was on the brink of ruin. Scott Cawthon had been developing games for at least a decade, mostly Christian games and RPGs. What was notable about Scott at this time was his ability to get games out quickly. In 2003, 11 years before Five Nights at Freddy's, this man made 16 games in one year. However, it seemed that neither quality nor quantity was important, as the public wanted nothing to do with his games. The Desolate Hope is probably his most noteworthy game pre-2013, and even then, it wasn't a blockbuster. That 2013 game I mentioned was Chipper and Sons Lumber Company. At its core, a simple little tycoon game about beavers selling wood. But it's not about what's on the inside that matters, it's what's on the outside. And what's on the outside is... Ugh! Yeah, people don't like this. The designs of Chipper and his son creeped people out, with journalists saying the game was downright terrifying with the soulless rodents staring at the player, and compared them to broken animatronics. And he took that personally. On his last legs as a developer, Scott decided to go all in on a new idea a horror game that would take those negatives and turn them into positives. Five Nights at Freddy's. To fund the game, he'd take it to Kickstarter and- <laughs> Yeah, this is the classic story about FNAF 1's development. Scott made a Kickstarter for the game and it was a cataclysmic failure. Not but one shekel was thrown to this game and it seemed destined to shrivel up into obscurity, but Scott soldiered on and released it on August 8th, 2014. To modest success. Okay, so what is a Five Nights at Freddy's? My parents have been asking me this question for years, and I think it's finally time that I give them an answer. FNAF puts you in the shoes of a night guard tasked with keeping an eye on the ailing Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria. It's old and busted, sure, but there's still plenty of life. 
maybe a little too much life. The four animatronics roam the halls of the pizza parlor at night, inching closer and closer, and it's up to you to keep them out so they don't shell you like a pistachio. Sounds simple enough, and the game is simple to the everyday observer, but the mechanics on display are unbelievably good. The first things first is that this game nails the atmosphere it wants to go for in every regard. The office you're in feels cramped and hopeless. The actual pizzeria is barren and lifeless, except for the animatronics. They're the exact right level of creepy they need to be. You could realistically see these as actual animatronics, and that's what makes them creepy looking. We'll touch on this later, but this is an aspect the games lose and lose it fast. The fact that it isn't always obvious if an animatronic is even on a screen you're looking at, causing you to lean in and luring you in for a jump scare, is genius in terms of horror. I know I bashed jump scares, but you can make fart jokes funny and you can make jump scares scary. It just takes an understanding of the atmosphere that this game has in spades. As for mechanical depth, this game has so many different moving parts to keep track of, like the time, energy, the cameras, the doors, Foxy who plays by his own rules, like being pirate themed in a restaurant with no other pirate theming. Why why is Foxy a pirate? And why aren't later Foxy's also pirate themed? This has been pissing me off for years. Help! All of this put together manages to capture the exact same feeling that Amnesia did, just to a different degree. You're in a constant state of just barely holding things together. You may have something over there under control, but something over here could be falling apart, or there could be a giant bunny coming to nibble on your prefrontal cortex. The sound design in this game is out of this world. The drone of the office, the low hum of the camera, the heavy thud of the door slamming shut, meaning that your safe is all great, but the best is when you try to slam a door only to get a Oh no! This game on its own is just a perfect example of everything a good horror game should be. The jump scare isn't the only thing the game has, it's the punishment for failing to keep up with the tension built up over barely scrambling by unbeatable odds, and this struck a chord with tons of people. Like a few metric tons, Five Nights at Freddy's was the exact sort of horror game that YouTube playthroughs were made for. It's unnerving, it's tense, it gets big reactions, and it makes for fun content to watch. I'm not gonna kid you and say I wasn't waiting with bated breath to see Markiplier play it, and every upload was like a big occasion. The gameplay was part of the reason, but the other was the main thing that made FNAF such a big hit, and depending on your perspective, either raised the viral horror genre to new heights, or sunk it forever. LORE! While yes, games like Amnesia, Slenderman, and Containment Breach all had lore, it was all either out of game on forums or other websites, or was integrated more into the actual plot of the game. FNAF's plot is just the average night shift at 7-Eleven. Looking closer at the details like backgrounds and the phone conversations that start every night lead you to a story about five missing children who were killed and stuffed into animatronics, and now their spirits were haunting them to go kill even more people. Not only was it way more dark and grim than what was normally presented in the game, it was was also rare. Newspaper clippings would only occasionally show up with vital information to learn the stories, and when people did find them, they would cling to every word they said, trying to piece together anything, and it made not only for an interesting story, but a fun one, as we would cling to any lead we could to try to figure out even a little bit more information, even if the sources ended up being, it came to me in a dream. Some people watching this are younger than the Sparky the Dog rumors, and I hate every single one of you that is. So this was a game that took a flagging developer and now suddenly made him and his game the biggest of 2014. Surely the time would be taken to ensure that the next game would be even better. It's out. Yeah, not a lot of people mention this, but Five Nights at Freddy's was the 29th game Scott made that year. What Sea Witch's curse was he working under to make this his Wikipedia page? FNAF 2 was released in November of 2014, a mere two months after the first game. While many would think that the short turnaround would be detrimental to the game, FNAF 2 manages to raise the stakes even further. More systems at play, no doors to remove the sense of protection you did have, and more than double the animatronics, now coming in toy and withered variants. There is one scary looking animatronic in the whole game, and that's Withered Chica. The rest either try way too hard to be scary or are trying way too hard to be cute, uh, that they miss the mark in two completely opposite directions. The puppet is the only other cool addition to the game, and his music box mechanic makes it so you actually needed to use the cameras. The gameplay is similar, but at the same time isn't too derivative. It manages to carve out a niche while 
while still being recognizable like a good sequel should be. What it improved on even more than gameplay mechanics was lore, however. This game was fit to burst with revelations and all new questions, like seeing the kids be killed by a man who may or may not be literally purple, seeing the puppet give life to the kids as the animatronics, and even figuring out that the whole game was a prequel instead of a sequel. Five Nights at Freddy's knew exactly how to make the players hang on every single second of gameplay, story, anything. It was all masterfully pulled off. These Atari-style minigames blew my little 14-year-old head when I first saw them. And to keep up the standard of the newspapers in the last game, these would come at random whenever you were killed. Yeah, you get all the lore you want, you just gotta take a Mach 10 uh. Fox to the face to find out. In a shocking turn of events, Scott actually gave himself time to make the next game. It wasn't until March of 2015 that we would get Five Nights at Freddy's 3. And while we waited, we got drip-fed information through Scott's website, revealing tiny nuggets of info one after another that you needed to do things like uh, brighten the image or go into the source code of the site itself to get. It was something that no one before Scott had ever done, and they were pulling us along on a string to the climax of the biggest sensation on YouTube ever! And when the game finally dropped... Eh. Five Nights at Freddy's 3 is probably the most, or was the most, divisive entry in the entire series. You either love it or you hate it, and I... I kinda hate it. So this game takes place 30 years after the original FNAF, as you now work at the attraction recreating the events of the first game. Those were real murders that happened in the real world, you're making a Jonestown roller coaster. why'd you do that? Your job sucks and is terrible because they don't actually have any animatronics at their animatronic attraction. However, they managed to get one, Springtrap, an old animatronic with a rotting dead body inside of it. Not only does he start roaming around to get at you, but hallucinations of the rest of the animatronics do. First things first, this game mostly nails the atmosphere like the others do. It's good. Really good. Springtrap is the best design in the entire series, and it's not even close. He hides so well in the cameras, it has some of the best use of movement in the entire series. The Fazbear Frights attraction is disgusting and grotty, it's all good. Except for the notable issues. First off, with Springtrap being the only real animatronic, him being the same color as most of the backgrounds is as annoying as it is scary, since you're gonna miss him because everything in this game is green. And those phantom animatronics? They're the worst part of the game. What the other games did so well was establish jump scares as a failsafe. If you're getting jump scared, you didn't keep up with your tasks. With the Phantom animatronics jump scaring you whenever they feel like it, you're getting jump scared left, right, and center, which makes the actual game ending jump scare so much less impactful. And trust me, this guy needs all the help he can get being scary. Hello, Marcus. I'd like to commission you to make an NFT. The gameplay loop still has a lot to keep track of, but with the jump scares coming as fast as they do, it's hard to not get annoyed with them after a while. Lore wise, though, this game goes into overdrive. Every night you have cutscenes of the purple guy from the last game disassembling the animatronics, with you getting to walk around and find clues to unlock more mini games. They're accessed by futzing with the arcade machine, clicking on certain background elements, or punching a code into a wall like it was a number pad. Okay, nobody liked this, but what it reveals is earth shattering. The guy stuck inside of Springtrap is the purple guy, the murderer, and he died in a Freddy's restaurant that was closed down and boarded up a long time ago. And if you managed to do all the mini games, which no, I still don't really know how punching a wall accomplishes any of this, you get to free the kid's souls and gives us the best ending, a series with a perfect beginning, middle, and end, even if we didn't know which part we were in, a perfect horror trilogy. Huh? Ugh, I hate Five Nights at Freddy's 4. Th that's not fair. I don't hate Five Nights at Freddy's 4. I hate the fourth Five Nights at Freddy's. If you can't decipher any meaning from that, don't worry. I know it sounds dumb. The Five Nights at Freddy's 1, 2, and 3 were this perfect little self-contained story that had a setup and a conclusion that everybody was satisfied with. Sure, there were tiny details that didn't tie into the whole thing. If somebody could please explain to me what an R, W, Q, F, S, F, A, S, X, C is to me, I'd really appreciate it but that's fine. Getting caught up on stupidly small details and lore was something saved for MatPat. We could all just move on and do something better, or maybe even get a new story in the same universe. Instead, Five Nights at Freddy's 4 doubles down on the continuing story and gives us parts of it that we never needed. The actual game has you as a child trying to survive waves upon waves of animatronics as they try to get into your room. If we're going purely based on gameplay, FNAF 4 clears the others by a wide margin. This is the most unnerving game out of the whole lot because of its focus on audio. 
Visually, you have the least to go off of out of any game thus far, but audio-wise, this game masters how to unsettle you through sound alone. Every noise creates a new piece of info telling you how to act, or it could just be your mind playing tricks on you. Of all the Five Nights at Freddy's, this is the only one that's going to stick with you in the same way that a game like Amnesia would, but sadly, for as good as the gameplay is, the animatronics had to suffer. These guys look stupid, I'll say it. The nightmares are very bad designs, cause I know they're supposed to be versions meant to look scary, but in trying to look scary, they do the opposite and look stupid. Freddy has three smaller Freddies that try to sneak up on you. This is comedy. Nightmare Fredbear and Nightmare Nightmare both look cool, but if you bat a one out of five, they bench you. It's sad how the actual build-up to the animatronics is scarier than the animatronics themselves, and while you can say that for the whole series, it's more true here than anywhere else. Sadly, the drop in quality also applies to the lore, and before anyone comes at me, I know, technically the story told throughout the cutscenes after every night is a good story. This is generally regarded to be one of the better stories told in a single Five Nights at Freddy's game, but... I do have something to say. Yes, this story is good, but the stuff that it sets up, I don't think is. Well-established details in the continuity of the story are messed with for no reason, like adding a second bite before the bite that we all know about, the identity of characters is more confused than ever, and needless stupid details are piled on for seemingly no reason. Hmm, why is Toy Chica missing her beak? I don't know, Scott, why is my shirt red? Then there's the box. The box is stupid, the box has always been stupid, and the fact that there's nothing inside of the box makes me more upset than it should. I feel like this is where the series started to lean too much into the YouTube community. There was way too much hinting at stuff without actually paying any of it off. The general consensus of the series at this point was, okay, that's enough, we've earned a break. And for a full year, we got it. FNAF had gone dormant, save for Five Nights at Freddy's World, which was an RPG and had its own tumultuous history, which doesn't really fit into what we're talking about. Fast forward, to 2016 and we were back on the IV trip, folks! We got a new FNAF game coming out! After the community was convinced that this game was going to take place at a robo-sex house, Scott actually had to come out and state information with words, and we figured out this was going to be a sister location of Freddy Fazbear's. And the results were... Ugh. FNAF sister location is where a lot of fans, myself included, kind of dropped the series. The animatronics look brand new in a bad way. The setting was different. The presentation was all new. It looked like the whole purple guy story was over and we were taking a step in a new direction. And then the game starts. Before we even get to the title screen, we get thrust right back into the dead kid's story since we find out that William Afton is now a thing we have to worry about since that was the purple guy's name in the books and oh f me or their books. They're canon except when they're not, but between them, William Afton is the name of the purple guy, and we learned that the new Funtime animatronics were made by him because they have a compartment to store dead kids in so they can be taken back to a lab and killed and turned into Remnant, which is a baby soul mixed with hot metal, which then infects the animatronics to make them killers, and we know that this was his plan all along because Sister Location has blueprints from before Five Nights at Freddy's 4 because Afton had a kid that was killed by one of the Funtimes, which makes that the second Afton kid that was killed by them because the crying child was also William Afton's son. That makes the brother from Five Nights at Freddy's 4 mean that that was actually the player character from the first three Five Nights at Freddy's game uh, trying to track down his father's work. And did I mention we still don't even know what the bite of 87 was? As for the game itself, it's definitely the most appealing visually, mirroring how 4 was good with sound, this one's good with visuals. While I don't like the animatronic designs in this game, I have to admit they're good designs, just not for scary animatronics. And the gameplay? Well, the resource management had gotten extremely stale, so instead of that, Scott opted to make a game on Calvin Ball rules. Every night you're doing something different, tangling with a different animatronic. You get your ear talked off by baby, you have to get killed by a rabbit the size of your hand because you're on your way to becoming a frail corpse of a person at this point, and be stuck inside a springlock suit while you're attacked by little ballerinas. The innovative feature this time is that the night actually goes on for a full eight hours. I hate it here! These are all nice ideas, and honestly, I commend Scott for trying something so radically different from the other games, but they're not fun. The radical departure from anything FNAF related, save for Lupus and Fredbear, is something that I wanted to do, but I don't think this was really the way they should have gone. As it stands, I don't like Sister Location. 
at all. It's my least favorite. Up, up, up. Least favorite so far. And yet they won't give up. Pizzeria Simulator was a game that was dumped like a sack of manure by Scott onto Steam, under the pretense that this was a game meant to tide people over until FNAF 6. Only after booting up the game did you learn this was FNAF 6, a quick 8-bit minigame and you get some of the best content in any Five Nights at Freddy's games, the interrogations. But this raw, one-on-one -on -one nature is back to the feeling that the first couple of games evoked. You have nothing between you and a killer robot except a cattle prod that's not gonna save you when they go feral. You have a brand new character giving you instructions, a brand new layout for the main gameplay loop, new gameplay that's actually fun, Pizzeria Simulator does an amazing job freshening up the formula in a way that I actually find entertaining. When you actually do go to the classic FNAF style gameplay, your experience is radically different. Just like FNAF 4, there are no cameras that you can check, but unlike FNAF 4, you can't even move around so you're just stuck in one place. You can lure away animatronics using sound, and the difficulty of your night is proportional to how greedy you were during the tycoon portion. The sound is back to FNAF for excellence, with it playing such an important role, especially when the cheery pop up ads spell almost certain doom when they disable your controls. Not just that, but it does lore a little better. I'm not forgiving this game for making people question whether William Afton goes to a bar called JR's to drown his sorrows or goes to a McDonald's playpen, but the Fruit Maze game actually did really affect me when I first saw it. It's really well done. Not just that, it's a really funny game too, with all the different endings, but it drops all the comedy for the true ending, and you know what? I may not like the additions from Four and Sister location, but this ending, with every major character burning to death to finally end the story, I love it. I think that if you weren't going to end the series at three, this is the best possible ending. Just killing the past so it can't hurt anybody ever again. Pizzeria Simulator is my favorite FNAF game. I think it's fun, actually enjoyable, smart, scary, touching, and the perfect way to cap off everything. BUT THEY DIDN'T! Ultimate Custom Night was meant to be a funny little capstone with every animatronic sans the ones that nobody cares about showing back up for one big old jamboree! Except they went and put lore in this one too! What do you mean Chica was the first one? That doesn't mean anything! Also, this game is William Afton in hell, which is good, keep him there. But then FNAF VR happens! I don't want to go too in-depth on this game because I may have plans in the future, but let me just say this. Bringing back William Afton out of hell in a f***ing USB drive is not only very bad, but has made every piece of FNAF media released since worse for it. And Security Breach? I'm too tired for this. These games are a series of soaring highs, terrifying lows, and creamy middles, and that's not all it shares with a kinder bar. I'm both riding my teeth. When I was younger, I was all over this franchise. I took in every second of content I could, but as with diapers and chicken pox, I grew out of it, and that's fine. A new generation can enjoy it, and I can enjoy telling them why I had it better. It's a fair trade. But what I can't exactly grow out of is the effect this game had on internet horror. Nothing that's claimed to have been scary has been able to escape FNAF's influence, but it also shifted a lot of developers into a new direction. Children. Yes, FNAF was beyond successful with children. Having a core cast of characters that was instantly recognizable and infinitely customizable will do that. And it became the standard for your children's horror game to have a cast of a couple characters in a distinct style, with jump scares and lore for YouTubers to mill over till the cows came home. If you could somehow dissect this formula and exploit it, you could stand to make a lot of money. But could you still have the artistic integrity of making a good product while trying to maximize profit? Fucking no. Bendy and the Ink Machine was the first major game to be released in a post-FNAF world that really tried this idea to any real success. Created by Kindly Beast, now Joey Drew Studios, that will be really funny in a little bit, in 2017, Bendy and the Ink Machine is all about the 60s animation industry, with co-founder Henry Stein brought back to visit the Joey Drew Studios to take a look at stuff. Once he gets there, though, things are instantly stupidly bad. The idea that he got a second foot in the door after seeing this was the welcoming party is ridiculous. Let's get the most important thing out of the way first and foremost, this game is a visual marvel. For a smaller indie studio, Bendy and the Ink Machine has an instantly recognizable and iconic visual style from its environments to its character designs, there's nothing else like it! There's something else like it! I'm not kidding, my list of positives ends here though. I think this game's bad, but like, 
I can get why people enjoy it. Let's get the first thing out of the way. This game is anything but scary. Little blob boys come out of the ground every once in a while, and if you're doing something else and look over at the wrong time, you might get a bit startled, but other than that, I think this game fails massively at being scary. But that's partially down to it having one trick, and that's to move a bendy cutout past a doorway, and that got me once and never again. There's one good jump scare, but I feel like there's about 20 times where there was supposed to be a jump scare, and there wasn't, and that's it's not tension building, that's boring. Boring is the best word to describe this game, honestly. Nothing happens! You walk around, pick up a thing, put it somewhere, pick up another thing, put it in the same place. The number of times the challenge is just walk back and forth from a place with a new item was flooring to me. How many times do you want someone to put up with this? There are chase scenes with a big melty bendy boy, but the fact that your run is no faster than your walk means that there's no real excitement to the scene because you're just walking a little bit faster. That's on purpose too, because if you could move with any amount of quickness, you'd be able to clear this game in a lazy afternoon. The first three chapters of this game took less than an hour to blow through, and keep in mind that this was released episodically, meaning that I would have had to wait months and months for 20 minutes of gameplay. And I'm stupid! I was stuck on the bassoon puzzle for longer than any college student should have been, because I thought that running under the shower of evil black death ink should have killed me. And that lore that's meant to pull you in is just... I don't think it's there! I listen to all the tape entries that tell you the story, which for some reason are all diegetic, meaning that walking away makes it so you can't actually hear the audio, which is dumb, but I was on chapter 3 of a 5 chapter game and still didn't know what was going on! There's gotta be an explanation for you playing as the dumbest person on planet Earth. Listen, I know that complaining about intelligence in a horror game is like complaining about the sky being blue, but trust me, it gets unreasonable. Like I said, he walks in and sees a thick black tar-like substance dripping from the ceiling, deciding Oh, but I really want to catch up with old Joey Drew, and keeps walking. And it isn't even after the big ink explosion that we see a dead, gutted version of one of the characters. Your response to this is to just say, oh, that Joey, what did he do this time? Like, he didn't make your cartoons real and then taxidermize them. Then when a walking, alive Boris comes out from behind a corner, you're just like, oh, Boris, nice to see you, old friend. Want some soup? What are you talking about? But what finally pushed me over the edge was my number one issue. This game is broken. There were multiple times I had to reload saves because the game flat out stopped working. Characters wouldn't walk, items wouldn't spawn, and one time the game glitched so badly that the pause menu didn't go away, and I had to play up until a checkpoint with Vaseline smeared on my camera, at which point the game broke so badly that I had to restart the chapter altogether. Oh, I was so close to quitting when that happened. <laughs> no, I chose to quit after the fourth straight fetch quest in 10 minutes and got soft locked in a corner after boarding closed a door on me, which, fair, I have been smashing him in the head with a wrench whenever I could, but I just had to sit there and wait until the bendy monster came to kill me. I tapped out there, just about to get to the end of chapter 3, which only took me 56 minutes to get to. This game is all style without a single drop of substance. It's an empty mascot costume. It's got all the appeal on the outside, but if you karate kick it in the head, you got nothing. The gameplay is boring, the story isn't there, the game isn't scary, and yet it was somehow a massive success. 750,000 downloads off of Steam. That's a stupid high amount for an indie game, and while how much money that equates to is hard to pin down, what with how Steam games are constantly on sale, it's gotta be a lot. And if the games weren't making them any money, the mountains upon mountains of merch certainly did. T-shirts, ball caps, pop figures, little tubs of goo. This was the biggest rollout of merch I'd had ever seen for an indie game. Even Freddy took a while before it got into Hot Topic. Bendy was in Target pretty much day one. How did it get popular enough to warrant this? Well, we can thank YouTube again for that. Having that art style and characters helped bigger YouTubers like Markiplier and the only slightly more successful Jack Jacksepticeye get into it, and those two factors were the same thing that made it appealing to children. Children were the main audience for the game, and in that, I can see why some of the choices in the game were made, like the lack of big scares and simplicity. Ah, uh, hey there, sport, you want to try out our new scary game? Or I'm gonna need a license, registration, copy of your SAT score, your high score on the original Donkey Kong, no emulation, chop chop kid lines foreman. If you want to make a product for kids, that's totally fine, and if it's not for somebody like me, that's also fine, but the game is rated T for teen. If they really wanted to make a game for kids, why would it have been rated this way? Ah, uh, look at old man Jack thinking that a game's rating means anything. Shadow the Hedgehog was E10+, and you shoot cops in the face in that one. Not only did social media and the audience help, but the release model did too. The game having a staggered episodic release did amazing things, as it let people pick apart every detail, play the game, watch their favorite YouTubers play the game, think up the 
series, draw fan art, and then when things got stale, BAM! The new chapter! Not to mention that this original model helps a lot when it comes to how BORING this game is! If I had to wait three months between chapters, I'd probably forget how teeth-grindingly dull the whole thing is. Those theories would come back to harm the game in a big way, and with that, we have to address the elephant in the room. Joey Drew Studios, the company that makes Bendy and the Ink Machine, is a bad company. I'm sticking my neck out there to say that, but the way the entire franchise has been managed has been an exercise in kicking goodwill and fan support to death. The game's story, shocking nobody, was pretty much written as it was going, with the only solid points being the beginning and the end. This is reflected in how Chapter 3 originally had nothing to do with Alice Angel, but after fan support started swelling for the character, the team decided to rework everything to fit her in. That's bad. That's really bad, and contradicts the team's previous statements that they had everything planned out. Those theories I mentioned, with no crediting, were taken verbatim and just made the story. But when the story doesn't exist, you gotta ask, isn't that kinda stealing somebody else's work and not crediting them? Like, you have no story, you take somebody else's story, and then say that's your story. That's far from the worst thing that Joey Drew Studios has done, including laying off over 50 employees during the holidays in a staggered method that meant they didn't fall under the requirements for mass firing benefits in Canada, having those same employees sign contracts for more money that also happened to function as non-disclosure agreements, basically holding vital income hostage as a way to not expose their shady business. Having one of the main heads of the company claim to not make any money off of Bendy while still being able to afford several toys in the form of cars with Bendy vanity plates in the same year as the layoffs that were said to be because the company couldn't afford to stay open any longer. Flip-flopping on whether or not they don't care about the money or really, really care about the money, citing the risk of losing money as the reason to not fix the glaring issues in their flagship game, firing the community manager in 2020 and not the good part of 2020, and so much more. But why bring this up? This is just pointless muckering for me to put down a game I think is really bad. I think it's actually really relevant to show how clear a divide there is between pre-FNAF games and post-FNAF games. Games as a game and games as a brand. I feel like a lot of the problems with Bendy come down to the idea that Bendy is more than a game. It's a media empire. The game is just where you get familiar with the characters and story. The toys and the merch are where the real money's being made. And that comes through not only in the buggy nature of the game itself, but the unfinished story being written while the game was being made. These are all the problems that come from the rapid release schedule put in place because their eyes were bigger than their stomachs, and getting the game out quicker meant more merch could be made, and more money could be made off of that. That much is pretty clear when you see the four options on the start screen are Begin, Option, My Personal Favorite, and The Store Page. It's a soulless sort of development cycle that pans out well for nobody. If the game is bad, people won't play it, and if people don't play it, they don't want the merch, and if you can't sell the merch, you can't make the game. It's a system of game making that's absolutely soul crushing for the developers actually in the trenches trying to make a good game, and blatantly soulless to the people who play it. A game whose only note from the higher's up is get it out, it'll be good enough. One of those higher ups even saying we're making games for stupid kids. This isn't hard. This is a design ethos that is far too common in a post FNAF and viral horror landscape. And I don't think this needs to be said, but this is not Five Nights at Freddy's fault. It's the fault of the people in these companies trying to wring as much money out of children as possible. The higher-ups, not the developers themselves. But what about a game that didn't do anything like that? A game that didn't want to have an empire thrust on it, if anything, was made to mock that exact sort of game, and for better or worse, got it anyway. Baldi's Basics is a game that I feel incredibly bad for, and how, if we're being real, this game shares very little DNA with the other games we're talking about. This this game was the product of Micah McConaughey, a game developer making a game in under two weeks for the Meta Game Jam. This was an event where developers had to make a game about games, and it was under these intense pressures that Baldi was made. Baldi is the typical, oh, this game's just a little sweetie, you can't be mad at us, we're just a little funny boy. Surprise, I have your wallet and your life! Game where it starts out all cutesy and innocent before flipping and turning spooky. It's a formula that's worked gangbusters, as proven by games like Can Your Pet and Doki Doki Literature Club. If you're wondering why that game isn't a part of this discussion, oh, <laughs> brother, not today and not tomorrow. Baldi is meant to emulate old, cheap edutainment software like Sonic Schoolhouse, but after the intro, it quickly turns into a horror game where the teacher chases you around the school as you solve notebooks full of math problems. This is a type of genre that's incredibly hard to get right because after the initial shock value wears off, you kind of got to keep things up. That and it's incredibly hard to play these games as they're intended to be played, you're probably gonna find out it's a scary game long before you find out about it naturally. Yep, Suri, 
Club. This is just your regular Japanese schoolgirl kissing simulator. Just gonna go seduce. Oh my god. Now, there's a lot of, if not misinformation, then misunderstandings surrounding this game. First of all, that it was in any way meant to be taken seriously. If you still think that after seeing Gotta Sweep or Arts and Crafts, you flat out aren't looking at the same game everyone else is, this game has a very specific and very odd sense of humor. The way things are written, the low quality of everything from the audio to the character models is meant to be an indication that, ah, this game is not meant to be taken seriously. That's not at all including when the game outright mocks the player for looking for that wonderful natural resource lore. Destroy, destroy the game. Destroy the game before it's too late. What I'm saying is, is get out of this while you still can. Just don't. Don't know. The other misconception is that this is nothing but a simple Slender clone, when in reality, Slender doesn't have nearly the complexities of Baldi's. There have been full videos going into the complex mechanics at work in this game, but to summarize them, you have an aggression mechanic for Baldi himself alongside his hearing and line of sight, you have the other characters like Playtime and her jump rope, this is a bully and his item stealing mechanic, uh, the items themselves adding in tons of different ways to trick and avoid Baldi, the principal and how everyone is subject to the rules, even other characters like this is a bully. This sort of depth is more than games like Bendy and Slender had in their entire playtime, and they weren't even made in two weeks! Baldi soared in popularity to heights that a simple game jam game rarely does. Suddenly, the biggest YouTubers on the platform were playing it and getting tons of eyes on the game. And those eyes didn't exactly understand what they were looking at. See, Baldi has the same problem I suffer from. It's just too smart. As such, people didn't exactly pick up on it being a parody of viral horror games and mistook it for the genuine article. While it earned it ridicule from people who were getting increasingly sick of the genre and its stranglehold on content creation, for the record, people were saying they were done with this back at FNAF 3, it also earned the game heaps upon heaps of love and support. I remember when this game first hit the scene and I was so into it. I won't say that I saw it for what it was, before everyone else did, but it definitely felt different compared to the rest of the games like this. Fan art, fan games, theories that did just about as much as a screen door on a submarine, this game got the full treatment of a successful viral horror game, all without being one. This includes merchandise, but seeing as the game and an Amazon package could have started being made at the same time and the game might have been beaten, it changes the narrative a lot. Mika didn't even know this game was going to be anything, so if he cashes in, more power to him. Now, does that excuse the merch from being... Awful? No! That's it. And Mika himself is not resting on his laurels and is heartily working on Baldi's Basic Plus. This not only drops any horror elements from the game, but also has an infinite map generation system, which creates seeds for infinite level layouts. If this video hasn't seemed especially positive, I'm very sorry. Also, how is it to run Joey Drew Studios? But Baldi is a shining spot in a sea of greedy, short-sighted developers. <laughs> Did somebody say greedy and short-sighted? Hello Neighbor is probably the most bungled viral horror game. Unlike Baldi, you could see from the beginning they were trying to reach those lofty heights of FNAF and Bendy. Eerie Guest Studio is the team behind this game, and their main experience is in developing bite-sized simple mobile games. However, the team wanted to expand a bit more and ride that sweet FNAF wave. Or at least you think they would. I don't doubt that the game started off as its own thing, maybe looking to cash in on the viral horror market, but by the time we got our first look at the game, it was clear where the inspiration was coming from. Early builds showed off what made this game special and unique compared to all the other dime a dozen horror games at the time. The neighbor you would be saying hello to would be a learning AI. If you stealthed your way around just right, he would act like a normal guy, never the wiser that you were around. However, get sloppy and make too much noise and he'd get ya. Then on subsequent playthroughs, when you tried to get in the same way you did last time, he'd be expecting you. Locking doors, boarding up windows, setting traps. This was like if you took the Mr. Freeze boss fight from Arkham City and made a whole game out of it. And if you're gonna take any concept to make a full game out of it, that's the one. Adaptive AI like this was and still is some of the most fun and engaging content that a game can have and makes for endless replayability. Not just that, but this game had a fantastic art style. Just like Bendy and the Ink Machine, this game's art style is instantly distinctive and iconic and caught a lot of people's eyes with its cartoony aesthetics and stylized proportions. It's also here you get 
get a feeling for just how much Eerie Guest understood the genre they were entering, as the company and their publisher Tiny Build sponsored YouTubers to play their game. It's an incredibly common tactic for developers to try to reach out to popular YouTubers to get more eyes on their games, and uh, in case any of those uh, devs are listening right now, I just want to let you know that my integrity is both viable and even more so cheap. These developers clearly knew the power they had with YouTubers as their free marketing and knew exactly how to keep them invested. Say it with me now, kids. LORE! Getting ahead of myself there, though, this game would be drip-fed to people in the form of alphas released every now and again with improvements made along the way. Uh, but with the ability to see the game's progress in real time, something odd was happening. The game was getting worse. Alpha 1, a really effective and dare I say, good horror game. The walls of the house are creepy and barren, the hallways are empty and cramped, and the neighbor has a mostly good grasp on how to beat the player. He learns, he adapts, and he only occasionally gets stuck in walls. Alpha 2, a bit of an art style change leads to the game feeling a lot less intimidating, like its edges were sanded off. The controls are a lot more janky and imprecise, they focus on platforming, which is like making the focus of ice its heating function, and generally just felt like an odd step back and the game losing focus. Alpha 3 is when they stopped focusing altogether. The neighbor's house was much bigger and much sillier, like you're not breaking into somebody's house, you're breaking into Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. As a result of his house growing 20 times in size, the neighbor himself doesn't really seem to know what's going on anymore and stops being a threat and wanders around on his own, perfectly content to let you snoop around his private domicile. It's also a glitchy mess at this point, nothing in this game actually works. Alpha 4 is when most of the dev team was out to lunch, this is just flat out bad. That art style that got so much focus focus was now unfocused and messy, as the neighbor now had a train going through his house, water traps, spiked gates. This isn't the same house from the first alpha, this is the house you kill Sims in. You can actually track the progression of not just this game, but the entire horror genre through these alphas. The first alpha sought to be unnerving, creepy, and genuinely scary. The fourth alpha is where they didn't so much lean as they did fall backwards into the horror for kids' trappings. There's no threats, there's nothing scary, as it's so cartoonish and bright that any attempt to have a threat or scares is undermined. I can't stress enough, being a horror game for kids is not a bad thing, it just so happens that most of the high profile attempts to do it are bad. And bad was the flavor of the day when Hello Neighbor released for 30 bucks in 2017. The full game ended up being just as unfocused and unfun as the last alphas would lead you to believe, but whereas those were free, this was $30. 120 gumballs right down the drain. And then there's the lore. I don't even think there's anything worth getting excited about. From the beginning, the story was always, what's in the neighbor's basement? What's in the neighbor's basement? And by the end of the game, I don't know, like a hose? Lore in a game is fine, but when you forego writing a story and instead just vaguely gesture in the direction of something happening is when it gets frustrating. You're not Dark Souls, just tell me why anything is happening and we can move on. And if you tell me to open up one of those godforsaken books, I will bite you. So many viral horror games make the mistake of trying to get their lore and community interest to carry their narratives, but that doesn't really work when you don't even know what's in the basement. Earlier alphas and promotional material were filled with false flags and red herrings to try to get a game theory video, but when that's all it is, red herrings, you start to wonder what the point of looking for a story is when there isn't one. And if you do want to sprinkle in the story and death mini games across the game, make a good game worth playing too! You got Let's Players speaking genuinely about not liking something, that's more impressive than any lore you could write. There's a lot more stuff. But I can't honestly say that the stuff is better. And that's the one thing that I'll say about it, because if I, I'm expecting as a game develops, it's gonna get, like, more love. So a game does do-do bad things and falls on its face. Cut, print, we're good, right? Well, no, because like I said, this was a game made for babies, and babies generally have a higher tolerance for things that people like me with back pain don't. That's not an insult to people who enjoy Hello Neighbor, that's an insult to people who are younger than me. Well, the audience of children did indeed buoy the game, and however much money it did make, it was enough to continue the series with spin-offs like Hello Neighbor Hide and Seek, Secret Neighbor, Hello Engineer, which took the franchise into the realms of car building, which as Banjo-Kazooie proved, always works. It's a Google Stadia game, man, what do you want from me? If you need convincing, just know that the website has not one, not two, but three pictures of crows standing on gears.
Oh, all right, I'll give it a try. This is awesome! Not just games, though. Hello Neighbor has the standard rollout of t-shirts, toys, and heaven help me, books. Seven books! Okay, I know it's hip to make a book out of your game. FNAF did it, Bendy did it, why not the neighbor? Uh, but doesn't this seem like a lot? Seven books, I've played the game, I'm not convinced the neighbor is even real at this point. Beyond the books, and the toys, and even the games, there's even an animated pilot for a Hello Neighbor cartoon floating around. It's... Animated, well animated for the style they're going for, and hiring robots to read the scripts will do wonder when the uprising finally comes. My name is Nikki Roth. My neighbor, Mr. Peterson, is acting very suspicious after his children, Aaron and Maya, gone missing. And I've been watching him for a couple of months now. Listen, I know the special phrase for the day is, it's not a thing made for me, but... I don't know, man, this isn't very good. Then there's the tweets. Whenever I'm feeling down, I remember these tweets and I feel a little better. This, to me, encapsulates the whole problem with this type of game. The constant pandering to a community with the only goal to be to shill the game. Theorists, let's players, and the YouTube community holds so much power when it comes to a game's success or failure, and it's in these devs' best interests to keep the YouTube community happy and humming with theories. It's less benefiting from the YouTube community and more desperately trying and failing to exploit it. These tweets are just the death throes of a franchise losing its relevance, desperately trying to cling to someone who gave them so much of their success. The problem is, I've seen the pilot, and I have more problems from there. Theorize on what? The story? It's not hard to understand. The neighbor? He's hiding something, sure, but it's nothing interesting. How little time and money the animators and actors were given? Okay, now that might be worth looking into. This whole game development cycle just shows how bad this trend is for games as a whole. Instead of making a game for the sake of making a game and making it fun, it's making a game exclusively to profit off it, and again, that's fine, but when it's as blatant as this and disregards polish for the sake of profit, that's when it leaves a bad taste in your mouth. I keep talking about YouTube as holding a lot of power over these games, their developers, and the making of the games themselves. But what happens when YouTubers are the ones making the game? If you're somebody who's lived the exact opposite life than I have, Enchanted Mob may be a familiar name to you, but for those who aren't, it's an animation YouTube channel focusing in Minecraft FNAF animation. They've been around for years and years, and are essentially the iron bank of Minecraft animations. There's also a lot, and I mean a lot, that you could go over for Enchanted Mob's history and controversies and Oh god, do I want to do that, but... I feel like, unlike with the Bendy controversies, these don't exactly tie into the development of their game and as such would be kinda needless when discussing it. For my video, that is, if you want to talk about Enchanted Mob being scumbags, be my guest. That game, of course, is Poppy's Playtime. We're all gonna need to get really comfortable with the fact that I say Poppy's Playtime and not Poppy Playtime because it sounds better to me. I know I'm getting it wrong, and if Enchanted Mob has a problem with that, I will publicly apologize in the most disingenuous way I can, but until then, it's Poppy's Playtime baby. Released in October of 2021, Poppies is the game I have the least to talk about, seeing as there's the least game actually there. You play as the vaunted some guy going into a toy factory, but the toy factory is actually scary and scary things happen. There's also that precious lore scattered around in VHS tapes with some pretty competent actors reading out the stuff that I can barely hear. Why do all of these games insist on you sitting around to listen to all this stuff? I am six years old. I love Pixie Sticks and Fortnite. I'm not sticking around for this. As for the actual lore itself, Man, it's just as boring as the rest of the game. Like, most of it is just boring business jargon that doesn't exactly reveal a lot until the last one where it goes, Oh, by the way, this place isn't actually a toy factory. We make uh, monsters here or something. I'm gonna live forever. I guess that's my idea. You need a strong hook to draw people in, but I think this game's just fishing with string. The game's main gimmick are these little grabber packs that seem like they'd be really cool and have a ton of inventive uses, but they... They don't. Like, you use them to connect circuits, but that's all the interesting stuff they can do. And it also happens to be the most interesting stuff that happens in the game itself. This is a very slow burn game. So slow, you may not even realize that the fire's on, and that's because it's not. Poppy's Playtime saves its only set piece for the very end of the game, and while the chase with Huggy Wuggy through the vents is pulse pounding and cool, it isn't long enough to warn all the stuff I had to trudge through to get here. Meaningless electrical puzzles that felt like they could have been airdropped into any game without taking it advantage of the Toy Factory theme, long bouts of nothingness without a sense of dread to keep you on edge, it's such an empty experience that I struggle to even think about what to say about it. And for a game that originally cost five bucks, it's painfully short. This is a proof of concept that you have to pay for. 
You get a few easy puzzles, some guided tours through air vents, one cool chase scene, and it's over. My playthrough of the game only came out to about 12 minutes of anything really happening, disregarding the toy making section which sits you down and lets you really think about what can be considered gameplay. And if we're all being honest with ourselves, there's only about 3 minutes of actual gameplay that I would consider good. 5 bucks for what is really 3 minutes of anything actually interesting happening is a really bad deal in my opinion, but if you felt like that was too generous, you could fork over more money for even more products! For a game that barely exists, there are toys, apparel lines, posters, plushies, backpacks, and Halloween supplies! This shouldn't be what gets made for a game that hasn't even been able to prove its own staying power yet. The game is going for a chapter-based release, and I'm not playing the next chapter, that sounds horrible, so it's going to be around for a while, but when similar franchises like Bendy and Hello Neighbor have faded from the public eye, I don't know if it's a great idea to go so all-in on poppies like they are. I spend more time looking at the electrical pylons than I do the enemy of the game, where's that plush? But then again, they're not exactly scared to show just how much of the franchise is based around making money rather than making something good. Yeah, we're gonna talk about the NFTs. If you don't know what an NFT is, please don't ask anybody you care about, they're just gonna confuse you more than you were going into the conversation, and I guarantee that they're going to look so much more tired by the end of it. Just know that they're planet-killing wastes of money with no value to anybody except the greedy scum lords that want to churn and burn a quick profit. Oh, hey, Poppy. However, this isn't your value brand scum. This is farm-to-table genuine scum, since they know that the lore is what people are here for, and as such, locked information behind the NFT paywall. If you're still somehow cautiously optimistic about this whole thing, first off, you're too trusting. Second off, you didn't just have to buy one NFT. You had to buy all six. At 15 bucks a pop, that means you're spending $90 in total in order to finish the puzzle. I generally tolerate but silently disapprove of most of the money-making tactics games and franchises like this use, but to lock that precious lore behind NFTs is despicable behavior. Because kids don't have impulse control, they're barely going to be able to know how to spell NFTs, so they're just going to beg their parents for it, and without the parents knowing any better, they're just going to buy them the JPEG and forget about it. Oh, but don't worry, Mob Games is running it back. They can't stop the NFTs because of contracts, but they're going to give the money to charity. Yeah, and what if people didn't make a big stink about this? Would they still be so eager to give all that money to charity? Even if the game is fine and really boring to me, the culture that surrounds it makes me feel so gross about the whole thing. Everything's suddenly cast in a whole new light where every environment, character, story beat, you wonder if it's an attempt to make something or if it's the latest Funko Pop they're gonna try to fleece more money out of kids with. It's a disgusting business strategy, and I genuinely don't want to support them, so I'm very happy they made the base game free, so I don't have to open up my wallet to this sort of stuff. I'm fully aware that most of what I'm saying can be seen as very mean and negative, but that's just because I'm a very mean and negative person. But there's something at the core of this discussion I can't stress enough. Making games for the sake of making money is fine. I don't have a problem with games being made with the purpose of making a profit off them. Game making for some is a hobby, but for others it's a job, and if making a scary game with lore and a cute art style makes them money, I'm fine with that and I'm happy they're getting paid for their hard work. Nobody is more aware than me that even with a full body talent transplant I couldn't make anything close to these games, and that a ton of people who work on them have no bearing on the actual marketing and money making aspect. Heck, in the case of a game like Bendy, they're not even benefiting from it. It's a job, and treating it like one where you have to make as much money as possible is totally fine. This video was never about disparaging the developers who are making the actual game. They're good people trying their best. However, just because these games are made by genuinely good people doesn't mean I have to like them either. A lot of these games fall into similar pitfalls, and that's mostly down to trying to maximize profits over fun. Oftentimes, these games are rushed, buggy, and horribly mis managed because they have deadlines to meet with merchandising or trends that are starting to fade, and it's that sort of philosophy that leads to unbelievable heights, but also crushing lows. A lot of these games live and die in very short periods of time, mostly dropping off once the game is over because there's nothing to bring people back, certainly not the gameplay because you couldn't pay me to play Bendy again. By the way, you totally could remember, my integrity means nothing. Games as a business is fine, but when the business is being as transparently shady and money-hungry as games like Bendy and Poppy are, it gets old really, really fast.